hands together for our next speaker, climate thinker and strategist, Dr. Gabriella Walker. Thank you. My entrance music, thank you. Uh, wow. So, did you hear those numbers that Johan Rockström just said? And if you did, did they sink in? Because we've heard two sets of numbers this morning. We heard this number from Christoph of a, a gigaton, a gigaton of direct air capture by 2050, which sounds insane. It's kind of doable, but it's a big number, it's a big target. And then we heard that number from Johan Rockström. Do you hear what he said? He said, between 12 and 15 gigatons of durable carbon removals needed by 2050. So thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations to all of you for all the work that you're doing to try to make this extraordinary endeavor happen. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we have a mammoth task on our hands. It seems almost crushing and I'll come back to that. So I'm Gabrielle Walker. Um, I've been working on climate change for, God, 30 years. I've been working on aspects of carbon capture for the past four or five years. Um, and I'm, I founded an organization called Rethinking Removals. And I'll come back to what we're trying to do uh, with Rethinking Removals in a moment. We're working with the UN FCCC high-level champions for climate action as part of the COP process. We're also working with Climate Action Platform Africa, with South Pole, and with quite a few others to try and make this stuff happen. So, um, what does it take? What does it take to start from an industry which is essentially at zero today and take it to between 12 and 15 gigatons by 2050? Um, I think that there's probably two things that it takes, and that's uh, uh, what Rethink Your Removals is trying to do. The first one is much better coordination, collaboration, cooperation, much, much more synergy, much less uh, waste, much more efficiency within the ecosystem itself. And that's what today is all about. That's what Climeworks are kindly hosting today. And that's also what Rethink Your Removals is going to try and do. So we're going to be trying to help coordinate the ecosystem. We're a not-for-profit organization, and we're helping to try and coordinate what you guys are doing so that we can, um, we can be part of this. Um, uh, the next thing, though, is not just uh, coordinating, not just becoming more efficient. Um, we, we, do want to, um, we do want to work with all of you. We've worked with, we, we know many of you right now. But not just that, but also how this actually fits in with the other pillars of the climate agenda. And I mentioned that, and it's actually hugely important, because um, if you think about how industries are scaled in history. If you think about something like carbon capture and storage, it sat around for about 10 or 15 years without going anywhere. And it was quite coordinated within the ecosystem itself, but it wasn't embedded in the outermost climate conversations. And so it languished. And nobody was actually saying we need carbon capture and storage for cement or steel or heavy industry or all the things that we now know we need it for. If you think about hydrogen, Hydrogen languished as something that might be useful for you know, uh, passenger vehicles and nothing else. It was only when it got embedded in the larger climate story that it became obvious that hydrogen can be used for so many other things, and it started to take off. Even you can say for solar, it's when it was really embedded in climate, after solar panels have been around for so long, solar PV have been around for so long, that the German government started throwing money at it, and it started getting really down the cost curve. And we've heard about, I mean, the, the concept of direct eye catcher has already been around for 10 years or more. How do we get it faster up that scale? So I would like to say to you, I'd like to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that as well as doing all the things that we're doing, as well as coordinating the ecosystem, we need to embed what we are doing in the wider cl climate conversation, both to look for opportunities and to assuage fears, because there are a lot of fears out there. I've spent much of the last two and a half weeks in various different conversations that have been happening. And in those conversations, I've felt a lot of fear. And there are fears about, in a way, there's three main pillars of climate that seem to be in conflict. There's carbon removals. There's also protecting existing carbon sinks. And there's also, obviously, carbon reductions. And I'm hearing all the time, if you talk about removals, you're not going to do reductions. Or what about deforestation? 
If you say only carbon removals can neutralize emissions, so only carbon removals can be used for net zero claims, then what happens to the money that's supposed to go to stopping deforestation, protecting peatlands, and stopping carbon coming out of natural sinks? And many of the people I'm talking to cannot hear anything about the need for carbon removals unless they are assured that they know how it fits into the overall story. And so if you look at that, I think we can be very smart about it. We can say, for example, if we look at reductions, we need to have 7% reductions a year. Let's have a target for that and a separate target for carbon removals so they don't conflict. If you think about protecting natural sinks, we need much more clearer language and much more clarity around what are existing sinks that need to be protected and what are new sinks that need to be made. And I think there's a lot of fuzz in the language. I hear people talking about carbon capture without saying what exactly you're capturing. Is it coming from a point source? Is it a fossil emission? Is it coming from the sky? Is it a removal? And what happens to it when you catch it? Where do you put it? How durably do you store it? So clarity of that language in the wider conversations is going to be very important to be able to realize what we all know needs to happen. And so we think in removals, we're going to be working in that space as well. We're convening dialogues in all of those areas of the voluntary carbon market, what constitutes a good net zero, starting to advance the idea maybe that carbon removals might be what you need to have net zero for your own organization. But the other things, credits for protection, credits for reduction, could be a contribution that you make to net zero for the wider world. So I wanted to say that as well, because it's not just clarity of language to look at how people are talking about this in the wider world. It's also clarity of language to see where there's confusion in terms of where the opportunities might lie. All the time, almost every day, I'm hearing people confusing CCS on point source emissions with direct air capture and other forms of carbon removals. There's massive confusion about it. People are saying CCS on a cement plant, that's a, that's a removal, isn't it? Because it's a sink. So I think we need that clarity to be able to separate out the different targets and make sure we draw the attention towards the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. For example, I was at an event in Brussels just uh, last week uh, where, which had uh, providers of, of, of uh, geological storage, it had uh, policy makers, it had potential customers, uh, heavy industry emitters, it had uh, direct air catcher players there as well looking together at what happens when you, when you think about CCS as a potential you know, uh, transitional technology for getting heavy industry to decarbonize, what happens to the infrastructure afterwards? And what happens to the infrastructure afterwards is you're building out the infrastructure you need for geological storage for direct air capture. So nothing is wasted if you coordinate. So this is a plea, if you like, to say, let's really make sure that as well as talking about how to scale this industry, how to coordinate amongst ourselves, and by the way, I will be here and here into the evening in the apparel, I would like to hear what you need. We're talking to more or less everyone in this space, and we really want to be here to help you find what you need. And also, at the same time, we want to get a consistent message about the people who are rolling up their sleeves on the ground, who know what it takes to make this happen and know what's blocking them, so we can take that to the wider conversations. And we're going to be doing a lot of that, and we invite you very warmly to come and be part of those conversations as well. So one of the reasons that I wanted to say all of this is that I think it's, uh, it's important to look not just at the numbers and not just at the ways that we can coordinate, and not just at the technicalities of what makes Article 6 work with voluntary markets and compliance markets, and also not just about how we go rapidly from a voluntary carbon market, which is pitifully small, to a much larger voluntary carbon market that incorporates removals at higher than the tiny percentage that they have at the moment, to compliance markets, where the real money is, and where we can really start to get the scale that, that, that Christoph and Jan are talking about, and that Johan was saying we needed. We need to do all of those things. But we also need to talk to the people who are trying to make climate happen and who are feeling terrified. Um, I was at a, an event in New York two weeks ago, where, and some of you were here as, uh, at that as well, where we did a workshop on carbon removals. I've been doing these workshops right around the world, and I keep getting the same message, you know, worried about fossil fuels, worried about keeping other things in play. But I began to realize at this event just what those fears look like. 
And there were a couple of people in the workshop, they could not hear anything. They kept on saying it was toxic, this was, a, this was morally bankrupt, uh, this shouldn't be done under any circumstances. I don't know if you're hearing this, but I'm hearing it all the time. And what we did was we unpicked it. We actually said, do we think we need to have carbon removals, as Johan Rockström has said? Do we have the science that tells us that we need to have them? And as we unpicked it, it became clearer that we did. Does everyone in the room agree that we need to have this amount of carbon removals to be able to get anywhere close to 1.5? Everyone in the room puts their hand up. Everyone in this room puts their hand up. So can we have a narrative that says, this is how we do this amount of carbon removals, while also this is how we phase out fossil fuel investment, while also, this is how we get the 7% reduction that we need, while also, this is how we protect the existing sinks, the rainforests, the, the peatlands, and so on. Can we have a narrative that does all of those things, and what does it look like when it fits together? And when we started talking like that, something extraordinary happened. I've never seen anything like it, but I want to say it to you now. I could feel the fear lessening. I could feel the focus coming. And at the end of the workshop, one person in particular who had been the most toxic and afraid came up and said, that was really powerful, I now see it, I understand it, I'm going to go home and rewrite the chapter of my book that I'd written about this. And she finished up with something else. She said, this has given me hope. This has given me hope. So today, we're going to talk about a lot of the nuts and bolts about how we make carbon removals happen. We're going to be talking about how we get lessons from previous uh, industries. We're going to be talking about how we get the finance. We're going to be talking about standards. We're going to be talking about how we do all those things that Christoph and Jan put up on the screen to say, this is what we need, bang, bang, bang. And on top of that, we need a narrative that connects carbon removals to the rest of the world so that they can see why this gives us hope. And between that event in New York and the event I was in in Brussels and the event just in the last few days in France, I've been hearing the same phrase coming back again and again, and I offer it to you now just before I finish. We're on the cusp of something really important. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a moment of truth. That's a phrase I've been hearing people saying again and again. This is a moment of truth. So it's tremendously exciting. When I watched what Johan was saying, this is what we need, I was terrified. But when I watched what Christoph and Jan were putting up there, I felt really excited. But it's kind of our choice now. When you're getting your heads down and when you're doing all of this, don't forget how important it is. This is our moment of truth. We have an immense challenge. We have an immense opportunity. And God help us if we don't take it. Thanks very much.